that's something that I always touch on when I write. I go a lot into the historical significance of the work. It's part of my thesis is showing how the work is tied to the history. You cannot interpret the book without understanding the history behind it. Hello, readers, and welcome back to another episode of In the Books, where we discuss your favorite works of literature from a historical standpoint. Now let's get into the books. Today's episode is about one of the most controversial works of American literature. You probably read it for school. You may love it. You may hate it. And right now, a lot of schools are banning it from their reading curriculum. So we're talking about Mark Twain's The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. So it has been a favorite of many since its publishing in 1884. But right now, many people are trying to cut it from their school's curriculum. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn follows the tale of a young boy and his friend Jim on their flight up the river in the American South in the 1850s. When Jim, a runaway slave, is captured, Huck resolves to help him, thus inciting the infamous escape sequence involving Tom Sawyer's dramatic schemes. Few books raise more controversies than Huck Finn because of the racial issues that are in the book and surround the work, both at the time of its publishing and in modern day. Twain's ambiguous position on race leaves many people unsure whether he was actually promoting racism or giving a satire of racism, showing readers why these attitudes are wrong. And the ending of the book is where this debate is most prevalent. The ending of the book features a crazy escape sequence where Tom Sawyer uh, hatches a plan to help Jim break out of the Phelps plantation. He and Huck launch this series of schemes to recreate some scenes from some romantic novels that involve prisoners escaping. And here Tom thinks he's going to live out some of his own fantasies and adventures in real life. But in the end, he really puts Jim in even more danger and does very little to actually better Jim's situation. And many people are taking this as offensive and saying that it ruins the entire book and we shouldn't read the book. And of course, all of the other racial material in the book they take that as reasons to not let people read it. But there's actually a lot we can learn both about history and our own society from studying this work. So for today's episode, we're going to discuss the historical significance of the book. And I believe that each of the characters really represents different groups of people in Mark Twain's society. And through his portrayal of these characters, Twain is actually satirizing certain types of people, and things that they did during the Reconstruction period. Even though the book is set in the 1850s, Twain wrote it in the 1870s and published it in the 1880s. So he is writing this post-Civil War and during the Reconstruction period. Yet he is writing about a time before the Civil War, which I believe is significant. Twain actually began writing the book in 1876 when the U.S. was celebrating its centennial. The U.S. had been a thing for a hundred years, and even though its core values are things like liberty, freedom, equality, pursuit of happiness, think of like Declaration of Independence stuff, not everybody in Mark Twain's America was able to enjoy these things. If you think about the whole race issues before and after the Civil War, the newly emancipated blacks did not enjoy freedom or equality like their white counterparts did. Even after the Civil War, they were not technically slaves, but they weren't treated well by most of American society. Those who remained in the South, many of them became sharecroppers. They were subjected to poverty and discrimination, and so their lot in life was really not much better. And they didn't even have legal protections to keep them safe from those who would try to harm them. And I think that through his writing of this book, book telling a story about the pre-Civil War, post-Civil War, Twain is actually giving us some commentary on his society. So let's take a look at some of our characters here. Many of us have already read Tom Sawyer, but let's kind of separate you know, that portrayal in, in his own book away from his portrayal in Huck's book. Tom is no longer the main character. He's not the main focus of most of the book. He's in the beginning of Huck Finn, but then he comes back at the very end of the book for this whole escape sequence, and many people protest his appearance 
just because of the things that he does at the end of the book. So, of course, Tom is the one that comes up with this whole plan, and he wants Jim to help him act out all these scenes, kind of like you'd find in a book. Twain includes a lot of allusions to other works of literature, you know, works that feature an escaping prisoner, which is kind of how Tom sees Jim. Tom's actions are really controversial because he doesn't treat Jim like a person, but more like just a piece in his game. I mean, people take issue to that, saying that Tom is being racist. But if you look at some of the other passages, you'd see that this is how Tom treats everybody. He's not singling out Jim. He, he uses everybody for his own amusement, basically. But if we're going to look at Tom's significance to the book as a whole and like the historical significance of the book, we'll see that Tom actually shares a lot of parallels with some people in real life. So when we talk about literature, especially literature that involves like racial issues, we'll often use terms like the hegemony. And the hegemony is the majority in the culture that makes like most of the decisions, is kind of in charge of everything. So in the American South during Reconstruction, the hegemony would be like the white people, mostly the ones who had a lot of money and were in positions of power and influence. Some of them, of course, did, still did not like the black people and did not want to make any efforts to help them. And then some of them did try to be helpful. And, th and there are others who, you know, just went along with whatever they had to because, like I said, this was Reconstruction period and the South was torn apart by the Civil War. And so there are many that just went along with the rules of what had to happen after the Civil War when the Union kind of took over some things and kind of told the South how to put things back together and the changes that they needed to make. So let's look at how Tom Sawyer represents how there are many white Americans who were, quote, helping blacks, but it wasn't really genuine. Some of the things that Tom does during this section is he really forces Jim into this role, you know, and kind of makes him into a character instead of seeing him as a person. If we're looking at Tom as a symbol, then our indignation should really be turned towards the people who act like this in real life because Tom's real life counterparts were adults and not just delusional teenagers. And these adults knew what they were doing and they did so because they did not care about actually helping other people. And one of the reasons that Tom and his counterparts acted this way is because they could not relate to the black struggle and they did not take them seriously. They didn't have their experiences and they didn't take the time to really consider them as people and their point of view. Just like Tom does not understand the gravity of Jim's situation. Like I said, Tom sees his whole life as a game. He is part of the, shall we say, the privileged class and his life always goes his way. It always works out for him in the end. I wrote an entire paper on Twain's life and his experiences with race relations. And he grew up in a slaveholding community in Missouri where everybody just acted like this is fine. Like this is how life is. And so just like the people in real life, Tom didn't see a problem with this. And so he never actually considered the other's point of view and how thing, there were things in life that were not right for them. When things are done over and over again and treated as normal, people begin to think that it's okay, even when it's definitely not okay. At the end of the book, one of the biggest parallels I actually see between the book and real life is how Tom's plan actually does more harm than good for Jim. So even though he is, of course, turning this whole escape into a game, he still thinks that he is doing a good thing. He thinks that he's still helping Jim. He's just doing it in a roundabout way that will be the most fun. In the end, though, we see that he really leaves Jim in an almost worse off position than before. And then when they're all recaptured, they're about to put Jim to death when Tom has to come clean about the whole plan, actually admits that Jim was secretly freed all along. It re it's really painfully ironic when you think about how that symbolizes history. When the slaves were emancipated and everyone was like, oh, what a noble thing to do. But really, they're people and they should never have been enslaved in the first place. Just as how in the end we find out that Jim was secretly set free by Miss Watson. Just the irony that this whole 
struggle was for nothing. So even worse than the unnecessary amount of danger and struggle that he's put through, I think the worst part is that Jim's situation is almost worse than it was before, even though he has been freed, which is, you know, something that every human being wants. He certainly isn't all set with a place to go and a job. He can't even be with his family, who are still slaves across the river. He doesn't have enough money to be able to buy them back. He doesn't have a place to live. He doesn't have a job. And like many Black people during Reconstruction, he'll be kept in poverty where he won't be paid enough to be able to, you know, go where he wants and live how he wants. It'll be almost like being a slave again. And he also won't have the same rights as everyone else in his community. Because remember how the Jim Crow laws kept people segregated and we didn't have civil rights. We didn't have equal rights for everybody in society. And so Jim is going to continue to face discrimination And because he is free, he doesn't have the same amount of protection that slaves would have because slaves, quote, belonged to somebody. They at least had a measure of protection since they were considered property. If someone, you know, was to harm a slave, then the master could take legal action against them. But free blacks did not have legal protection like that. One of Mark Twain's inspirations when he actually switched his views from going along with the hegemony and racist ideas to beginning to advocate for equality was this incident that happened in Tennessee in 1869, where Mark Twain read about a lynching that occurred. And and Twain finally realized just how bad things were and just how unjust everything was. And then that's when he switched his views and he started speaking out against injustice. I think of that when I read about Jim now being free. He could be subject to that. His situation is just really pitiful because all the other characters just leave him be and he's just on his own to sink or swim. So in this episode, we've been discussing the adventures of Huckleberry Finn and how to interpret it from a historical perspective. We discussed that many people will point out problems with the book and its characters and how they relate to the race relations. But if we consider the historical context of who wrote the book, when it was written, and just a lot of things happening in the current society at the time, it's more likely that Twain meant this as a satire. And he was pointing out problems. Twain is really calling people out and saying that we need to make changes, which is a very effective purpose for literature. Thank you for joining us for another episode of In the Books, where we talked about Mark Twain and Huckleberry Finn, which is now In the Books.